jury selection is continuing. They're trying to get to that magic number of 18. There's a lot to break down in this case. And one of the things that I've had a chance to observe is the judge, Judge James Burke, who's presiding over this case. I've watched him day in and day out. And I had a series of questions to ask when I just was alerted to the fact that Vinu, you know James Burke. And, and I got to judge Burke. And I got to tell you, he has a very interesting demeanor about him, the way he handles both sides. He did get a little bit in trouble with the cell phone comment and saying that you, you know, threatened to throw Harvey Weinstein in jail for the rest of his life. That was a controversial comment. The defense tried to have him recused. It didn't happen. Give us some perspective on who Judge James Burke really is. Well, Judge Burke is a showman. I've known him probably about 15 years. I appeared in front of him when he first became a judge in Brooklyn Criminal Court. I was a prosecutor then. And I had to go back to criminal court. When, you're, when you become a senior prosecutor, the last thing you want to do is go back to criminal court and deal with misdemeanors. But then there was this case involving the assault on a police officer that the supervisor asked me to go in and handle. So I had to go in front of him. And he, uh, he's, uh, he, he's one of these guys who likes to be chummy chummy with the prosecutors and everybody. And so he and I butted heads. Uh, ultimately, you know, he, he gave both sides a fair trial. I then didn't see him for a few years. Then he switched from Manhattan, uh, from Brooklyn to Manhattan, I, and I became a defense attorney in 06, and most of my state stuff was in Manhattan. So eventually I'd run into him, and I'd run into him. I, I've socialized with him at bar associations. He's a, he's a, he's a very, very charismatic, um, he's, a, you know, he's a showman. But in, he gave my client, I did another trial in front of him as a defense lawyer. And as a defense lawyer, I mean, he gave my client a fair trial. And ultimately, I think he's a good judge to try a case in front of. I think not for this kind of case. Why for not this kind of case? I think there's too much pressure on him. I think in this case, you have a lot of problems. Some of his decisions are problematic. I think they're opening up grounds for appeal. I think his comment about the cell phone, I think right at that point when he made that comment, that. It hit me, and the very next day, Idala and his team made the motion to recuse himself. Should he have recused himself? I think at that point, yeah, because you've made a comment. Look, the guy's, you know, using a cell phone. But don't say he's going to throw him in jail for us. That means that, pre that says that he's intending to throw this guy in jail for the rest of his life. What else does that say? There's no other explanation. Well, there's one attorney who's going to be in front of him, and that's Donna Rotuno, one of Weinstein's main attorneys. We believe that she is going to handle the bulk of the cross-examination of these women who are testifying against Weinstein. She spoke and, and had some words for the media on the first day of trial. Take a look. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Obviously, today was a procedural day. Um, we are ready to start this jury selection tomorrow. Uh, as you heard, again, Ms. Aluzzi is attempting to silence us from speaking to you and speaking to uh, the people of New York and country and the world, frankly. Um, here we are looking at a circumstance where she stands up in front of a court and calls my client a predator. Mr. Weinstein, again, has a right to a fair trial. I think she believes he's convicted already. That's not how this works. So we are here hoping to pick and find a fair jury. And um, we believe that that's going to be possible. And we're going to continue to press on and remind everyone that in this great country, you are innocent until proven guilty. And no evidence has yet been presented to a court or a jury, a trier of any fact. And that is why we are here to start this trial. Um, I thank everybody for their time. I'm going to let Damon speak about the motion issues today. You know, I think that in the end, the government doesn't want our side to have a voice. I think they believe that their side of this story is the only one that matters and the only one that counts. And that's what this trial's for. This trial is to show uh, the jury, the state of New York, and the world that there's more to this than, than they would like everyone to believe. And the world is going to be watching her. The world is going to be watching how she cross-examines these witnesses. What should she do? What should she not do, Terry? Well, look, I think she's going to have to get the facts from them. And so she may have to go at them a little bit. But I do think it's important that she not push too far. I don't think that she should beat them up. I think what she needs to try to determine here is there was consent. That's what she's trying to do as far as her client is concerned. So ask those types of questions that will show that these witnesses were there on their own free will. They could have left at any time. That's what she needs to do. Let me follow up with you on this. We heard from uh, Linda when she interviewed Luis Godbold. There was a discussion about uh, the optics of a woman attorney interview, uh, cross-examining these witnesses. 
Linda didn't feel that's necessarily better. What's your take on that? Well, look, here's what I think. I do think it helps to have a woman doing the questioning, but I don't think there's a double standard here. In other words, I think the female defense attorney should do the same thing as the male defense attorney. And I think she should be as careful as a man should be. But I do think optically it looks a little bit better to have a woman defending Weinstein. All right, Vinu, I'm going to ask you the million dollar question. It's impossible to get an impartial jury here. Look, there's like a 100% recognition rate in terms of people know who Harvey Weinstein is. Uh, it's, they know about the allegations. But can he get a fair trial, whether it's here? whether it's in Albany, whether it's in Suffolk, because those are the other jurisdictions where the defense says that this trial should be moved to, can he realistically get a fair trial? I think he'd have a better shot in Suffolk or in Albany than he is going to have it here in Manhattan, the center of the of New York, the center of the world, you know, to, so to speak, right? Where Harvey Weinstein is hanging out in Tribeca, and, and somebody saw him screaming on a phone, and then another woman says that she knew somebody was in a hotel room, and I mean that. I think Idala's motion was correct. You know, I know Idala for many years. He's a, he's a top-notch lawyer. That was a correct motion. He should have, she should have struck all those jurors who heard that comment. And his motion to have individualized voir dire, I think, is a good one. In a case like this, where the media is so on top of things and, and there's so much going on, I would like to add something to what you were saying about, uh, and slightly disagree with you, about the female cross-examining lawyer. I think she has an advantage. Because as a man, when sex crimes cases, when I'm dealing with a complainant, I never use the word victim. The, I may use alleged victim at best, a complainant. There's a, there's a line that, as a man, I have to be careful with. Sometimes I can use that to my advantage, right, as a man cross-examining a female complainant. She gloves off. She can go. I think, it's, I think she's brought in for a reason. She's a fighter. She's, that's her reputation. Go in. She's going to go after these women as people that were power hungry, seeking to get ahead in life. And now they got buyer's remorse. I think she should go at them. No holds barred. Well, there is an argument to be made that uh, there has been reports that Weinstein, one of the reasons he kept switching up his legal team is because he wanted to have a female attorney uh, on top of this. Uh, and obviously, the witnesses are huge here. One of the questions that was asked by the prosecutor uh, during jury selection was, can you, jury, can you decide to find someone guilty purely based on alleged victim testimony, nothing else? And they said yes. What does that tell you? Well, it was a good question because I think the prosecution needs to know the answer to that question before they proceed with the trial. And it's good to know that a juror can say, yes, I can find the client guilty just based on witness testimony. What it means is that might be all we see here. And it is important to have these witnesses testify. And it's, it's basically he said, she said. So yes, that's important. All right, well, we're hearing from a lot of different people during the course of this case, and we'll hear from more as the trial progresses. But we did hear from several of his accusers outside of the courthouse on the first day. Let's hear what they had to say. And I send all of my strength, and I know we all do, to yes, women that are going to have to be dragged through the mud for nothing else than being hurt. And for nothing else than maybe being traumatized survivors who acted to what other people would think is strange in the aftermath. But trauma, you kind of want things to go back to normal. You want to pretend it didn't happen. So whatever you hear about those women in there, know that there are 98 more and probably a thousand more out there that are just like them. And so they're standing for us. And I am, I'm immensely proud of them. And all three women, and Annabelle Shore going on too. This is a huge, huge moment. And we didn't have our day, but hopefully they will. And we join hands with them. And their victory would be our victory. Their loss would be our loss. In my personal experience, the abuse and my choice to speak publicly about it have damaged my health and my career. As a group, we have been threatened bullied, intimidated, and retaliated against. Harvey implemented these scare tactics to silence the many voices who for years were not able to speak. We will not be silenced anymore. We represent thousands of people from all walks of life who have courageously come forward to share stories of sexual violence and have taken a stand despite the danger of retribution. This trial is a cultural reckoning regardless of its legal outcome. 
It is a victory to see Harvey Weinstein and the systems that have protected him for decades held accountable. But this will not end with Harvey. By coming forward with our own stories, we are working to create a culture where survivors can come forward without fear of retribution and retaliation, and where shame and silence are no longer the norm. We are proud of the progress we have made so far. The world is watching. This trial shows that abusers will be held accountable despite their attempts to keep the abuse behind closed doors. It is now the job of the judge and jury to make the right decision and put this dangerous man behind bars where he can live out the rest of his days paying for his crimes. But regardless of the outcome, we will keep fighting to create a world where it is no longer dangerous to speak up. A world that believes survivors, holds abusers accountable, and where respect and safety are the rule and not the exception. Thank you. Do you think the culture has already changed or not? Yes, because we used to be shamed into silence, and now that we've spoken out and made it a, a cultural norm, the Me Too movement is a reckoning to not have to tolerate abuses in the workforce. And that's what this is about, is not having to be sexually taken advantage of just to get ahead. Vinu, how tough is it? Although the judge instructed the jury this isn't a referendum on Me Too, this is only supposed to decide the facts of this case and the evidence presented, how hard is it going to be for a jury to put all that away? The, everything that they heard from the outside, everything that they're seeing in the media, everything that they've known about this case, how hard is it to just say, I'm going to focus what's presented to me in that courtroom? I think it's nearly impossible. I, I think particularly with this defendant, who basically spawned the whole Me Too movement, correct? So, like, that's the problem here. And when you watch those interviews, look what she said. She goes, we hope that the judge and jury come to the right decision and put this... So if that's the right decision, why go through trial, right? What's the purpose of, of having a public trial? And when I said earlier about Judge Burke making some wrong decisions, how do you allow... You can understand, you talk about the theory of prior bad acts, but how do you allow four other women to come forward to say that they did this? Because now what you're doing is saying that because he did it in other cases, that these must be true. And when you go to your earlier question about can this be believed on just uh, quote unquote alleged test victim testimony, well, the prosecution needs to get an answer to that, like you said, but that's also highlighting to the jury that there are some issues here. You know, the, one of the big questions that came out yesterday to, to jump off of what you said is the juror members were asked, well, what happens if you find him not guilty? Can you go back to your family and friends and say, yes, I found him not guilty? The difficulty in that, Terry, what, that's a good question, right? There is so much pressure out there to find him guilty, which is why it's hard to find a jury who is not going to find him guilty. You have the Me Too movement, you have all of these women speaking out, and it's beyond just this trial. It is a social event, and you need to make sure you have jurors who can make that right decision and not feel the pressure of having to convict him. Vinu, you're a smart guy. Help explain something Thank you. to me. <laughs> so the <laughs> appeals court said they're not going to delay the trial. They're not going to stay it. But they haven't issued a ruling yet as to a change of venue. They say they're going to issue that ruling on Tuesday or Wednesday, right when opening statements. What's going on? And are they really considering changing where this case is going to be held? It sounds like they are, but to wait that long, I mean, they should halt. They really should halt the jury selection until they make this decision because ultimately they say they'll make a decision before a jury sworn. Once a jury sworn is, you know, double jeopardy attaches, right? So they have to make that decision. And what are they going to do at that point? Are they going to move it with these jurors? These jurors are not going to go to Suffolk County or Albany County. I mean, They'd it's very bizarre. Over. They have to start the whole jury process, absolutely. But I, I, I think it's a, it's a solid motion. And I think that the appellate court should take it seriously. You have these press conferences going on right outside, and, and you have all these people saying all these things. Well, there's no way that that's not being, you know, getting into these prospective jurors. They had a flash mob outside, um, and the chance the rapist is you could be heard all the way up on the 15th floor. So that's a, obviously, and these jurors are coming in and out of the courtroom every day. Obviously, you can see why the defense made that motion. Let's take a break. Clearly, a lot more to talk about. Stay tuned. A lot to break down in the Harvey Weinstein trial right now. Remember those L.A. charges that were dropped on the eve of jury selection here in New York, like the very first day? Remember when that was a surprise? Well, let's go back to Jackie Lacey, uh, who's the L.A. County District Attorney, when she announced those charges, and we'll talk about it. 
victims of certain sex crimes occurring in California after January 1st, 2017 will no longer be subject to these statute of limitations issues. I supported these charges, um, I supported these changes, excuse me, because the sexual predators should not go free simply because it took time for a victim to report the crimes against them. California law also permits prosecutors to call victims of uncharged sexual assaults into a courtroom to testify that a defendant has a propensity to commit sex crimes, providing valuable supporting evidence for other sex crime victims. I want victims to know that just because we may lack sufficient evidence to charge their assailant, it does not mean that a crime did not occur. It simply means that the evidence was not strong enough to meet our standards. To those victims, I want you to know we see you, we hear you, and we believe you. And while a criminal case may not have been filed, it is my hope that all victims of sexual violence find strength and healing as they move forward. We need the voices of all victims to help us remove sexual predators from our community and protect others from these violent crimes. I want to congratulate the, the work of, of these investigators to tirelessly build cases that would allow us to open this chapter involving Mr. Weinstein today. Secondly, as DA Lacey indicated, to each of the victims who have stepped forward to the Los Angeles Police Department, this is one instance in which cases have been filed and there are many other instances in which we've not reached that point yet. But to them, I extend a, a, a hand of support and strength and ask them to remain committed to these investigations. As investigators call, there may be additional follow-up or efforts that are made to further deepen their investigation and we need their continued involvement. To support people, those that are friends, family members of these victims, please continue to encourage them, continue to give them the, the strength and the ability to withstand the, the types of questions and turmoil that these cases uh, renew as far as these vicious attacks that occurred upon uh, these, these, these women in their lives. Uh, lastly, to victims that are out there who are yet unknown, the Los Angeles Police Department, as does the Beverly Hills Police Department, every law enforcement agency in this county stands willing and able to take your information and will aggressively pursue every lead to bring to justice those individuals who would prey upon you. Again, I thank the District Attorney's Office, District Attorney Lacey and her team for opening this next chapter against an individual who has gotten, along, gotten away with too much for too long. Thank you. Okay, we have an update for you, and the update is that three more jurors have been selected in the Harvey Weinstein trial. They are all white men. Let's break this down. Okay, so now the number that we have of jurors is 10. These are three white men. Yesterday, my understanding is that uh, the, uh, the four men that were already picked yesterday, three were also white, one was African American, and now we also have three women as well. I was in court, one of those women, uh, African American, I don't remember the other two. What does that tell you about where we are at right now with the jury? Interesting, I think that this is going to help the defense so far. I think they're doing a good job on the jury selection. The more men, the better. The more Caucasian men, and I'm not saying that they should actually go for race because they're not supposed to do that, but the argument can be made that these men will put themselves in the shoes of the defendant. And so I think that uh, it's helping the defense so far if most of the jury is male and most of the jury is Caucasian male. Well, Vinu, let's talk about some of the questions that were uh, brought forth by the defense to get these jurors. Uh, the question that was asked today by Arthur Idella is, who here thinks that someone could have consensual sexual relations with someone at work to get ahead at work. And we know yesterday that Damon Sharonis also said, do you think it's possible someone could have sex with someone that they don't find attractive for reasons other than love? Where are they going with these lines of questioning? Well, I, I think initially as an initial matter, and I think this is important, and, and his team has said it outside, we saw the clip from Don Rotino earlier, they have to fight this battle, right, both in court and out of court. So one of the important things that the media is conflating here is, is saying that he's got 60-something or whatever it is, counts of sexual misconduct. Look, sexual harassment and sexual assault are two different things, right? So the question is an employer, 
you know, is, is one thing, and what they're going with these questions, I think, is very clear. They're trying to say that this was in the context of employment. This is an employment issue. They're trying to show that, hey, some people may sleep to get ahead. But I want to add something about your thing about the jurors and, and, the, and the men in this case. I'm not, 100, I'm, not, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that, because particularly here in New York, it's a certain political sway here that most of the people have. I'd say, if you use the word liberal here, most of the men, often I find in sexual assault cases, they get emasculated. And they're not going to look at themselves as men. They're going to try to put themselves in the idea of, of a woman because they want to say, oh, I'd never be like that. So I, I, as a defense attorney in a sexual assault case, I'd rather have a jury of all women. Because I think that women can look at this, say, and if you, especially if you have a female complainant, and say, I call BS on that. And I don't know if, if there are enough strong men to be able to do that. That's an interesting perspective. And, and just to talk more about the questions, what do you think about this line of questioning? So let's go now to the prosecution asking these jurors. They said, uh, is there anything about his appearance today that makes you think he couldn't have done this? Why do you think they're asking that question? <laughs> I mean, let's look at them right there. They're well, asking about the walker, right? Exactly. They are asking about the fact that now he's trying to portray himself as a victim. He has a walker. He has actually said in the press that, you know, he's the victim here. So what the prosecution is trying to do is make sure that even if he comes across as weak, that they understand this is the man they are claiming did these horrible crimes. And at the time that he did these crimes, he wasn't as weak as he's looking now. Gloria Allred, who represents uh, some of these accusers and actually uh, who will testify as well, she actually had some statements as well about this case. Take a look. There were many issues discussed today, but for me, the most interesting issues uh, were, first of all, the uh, request by the defense to sequester the jury. Uh, that request was made because apparently the defense was worried that other charges may be filed by one or more other jurisdictions while this case is pending and in trial. And the concern was that somehow that would affect this jury that is about to be selected in this case and that somehow they might need to make a motion for a mistrial if that happens and if the jurors learn of it. Uh, it appears that uh, it may be that they were concerned about Los Angeles. I, I'm licensed in California and also in New York. And that there have been news reports that uh, there has been an ongoing criminal investigation by the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office for two years and that uh, it may be that charges will be filed soon. Let's talk about these L.A. charges. Uh, Vinu, I'll start with you. Uh, do you think it was coincidental that they're filed at the same time on the eve of jury selection? Let me tell you what that was all about. That was designed to put a nail in the coffin of Harvey Weinstein in New York. That's why the prosecutor uh, announced those charges the day jury selection was starting, because she knows that that's going to here get to the jurors in New York. They're, they're hoping in L.A., is that he gets convicted, right, that this would uh, put the final nail in his coffin. He gets convicted, and Judge Burke puts him away for life, which he said he's going to do anyway. So at that point, they don't have to try the case in L.A. They're not going to, that case is never going to trial in L.A. They want to see him convicted here. And anything, ultimately, they're just going to, that case is going to go away if he's convicted and sentenced to life here. Yeah, I mean, what, if he testifies, right, if he testifies in New York, that'll greatly affect what an L.A. trial will look like, I mean, in terms of what he says can be used against him. Absolutely. Anything that happens here is going to affect L.A. And I think if he testifies, that's under oath. That's testimony that they'll be able to use there. If he's convicted, then, you know, to your point, there's nothing else that we need to do if he's convicted and he goes away for life. If he's convicted and there's something less and he's, you know, uh, not going to serve life after he serves whatever sentence in L.A. can still come after him. So I don't think there are any coincidences here. I do think that it was sort of planned. I don't think it was coordinated, but I do think what the L.A. D.A. did was timing and it was intentional. All right. So more to discuss in the Harvey Weinstein trial. We'll be right back right after this.
Welcome back, everybody. We're talking about the criminal trial for Harvey Weinstein here in New York. But as you know, there was the civil matter as well. Well, Douglas Wigdor, who actually represents uh, one of the accusers in this case, he had some words about that settlement and whether or not his client should opt in. I also represent a, a woman, Jane Doe, who is yet to be identified at this trial. She will be testifying as one of the three Molyneux witnesses. She will be testifying uh, in the course of this trial. Let me just say this. The last time I stood in this before this courthouse, before a, a crowd such as you, was at the beginning of the dawn of a, of a different decade. It was 2011. And in 2011, I had the privilege of representing Nafisatu Diallo, the maid who we allege had been sexually assaulted and raped by Dominique Strauss-Kahn. Unfortunately, that case ended with the district attorney dismissing the indictment. But today, we start a new decade, a decade that has come so far with the Me Too movement. And today, we are beginning the process of holding Harvey Weinstein accountable for his actions. And so much has changed since 2011 because of Me Too. We no longer are strapped with the rape myths and the jurors that will start that will start selecting tomorrow and going through next week are in tune with the common rape myths that people aren't necessarily raped in dark alleys at gunpoint or knife point that women often know their perpetrator that women often speak to the perpetrator after the crime has been committed that women often don't go to the police or to authorities or tell their loved ones immediately after they've been sexually assaulted or raped and this case will be a testament and will be a, a trial not only about Harvey Weinstein, but where we have come as a society. Because the rape myths that the defense keeps talking about, about people being actresses, about people having contact with Mr. Weinstein after the alleged crimes, those are the things of the last decade, not this tech decade. And I am very confident that New York jurors will see through those cross-examinations. As I indicated, I represent a Jane Doe. She will be identified by her name later on during this trial. She was raped in 2005 here in New York at Harvey Weinstein's apartment. And there will be more details about her, and I will address you about that. She will not be making any statements or doing any interviews during the course of this trial. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention one other thing, which is considering that I represent two other women with civil claims, I should note that my client here who's testifying in the criminal trial has no civil claim. Her claims are barred by statute of limitations. She's not doing this for the money. She's doing this to hold Harvey Weinstein accountable for his actions and to help the victims in this case and the prosecution in this case. That is her only motivation. And I would be remiss, though, if I did not talk about the purported and alleged settlement that's been in the news over the last few weeks, because that settlement is one of the worst civil settlements that I have ever seen. It is a one-sided civil settlement, and my two clients, Waddell David and, K and Kaya Sokolow, as well as many other women who have contacted me in the last few weeks, will be vigorously objecting to that civil settlement. It's the only civil settlement that I've seen that pays $12 million to the director defendants who we allege were part of the scheme to enable Harvey Weinstein. There are also millions of dollars going to class counsel. There are also millions of dollars going to vendors, secure creditors. And to make matters even worse, to the people who want to opt out of the civil settlement, they are trying to bind them by providing releases to the insurance companies and providing releases to the directors. And my biggest surprise, frankly, is that the attorney general, the former public advocate, is not standing with me shoulder to shoulder in denouncing the civil settlement and making sure that Har Harvey Weinstein is held accountable not only in this courthouse for his criminal wrongdoing, but in the civil courthouse for the civil wrongs he committed. Well, he had a lot to say. Vinu, your reaction? Look, Doug Wigdor is one of the top plaintiff's attorneys here in New York. And so what's very interesting about that comment is what he started off with. And he talked about his case back in 2011. You should know a little bit about that case. That was a case that led to the arrest of Dominique Strauss-Kahn, the former who was running for president of France. They arrested him. 
The reason the DA dismissed that case is because they found out that she was making phone calls to her boyfriend in jail, talking about how much money she was going to get. Mm. And so for him, this was a big loss for him and his partner at the time, Ken Thompson, who then became Brooklyn District Attorney a few years later, who uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. So. He's somehow up there trying to right some personal wrong or trying to clear his name in the court of public opinion. Because if you Google him, his, that case comes up and trying to tie all this. Look, he's going to be a big winner. He's talking about other people getting money. If Harvey Weinstein is convicted, it makes it that much easier for him to proceed civilly for any and all of his clients, who he's, apparently he's got a number of them. Yeah, wow, that's a pretty interesting way to think about that. And Terry, you know, let's just take a step back and think about this case. One of the big things that I heard yesterday, and I'm curious how the defense will do it, is trying to paint Harvey Weinstein as the person who was being manipulated, the person who was being used. You know, perhaps these women were using him for some degree. It seems like a very tough avenue, maybe tricky <laughs> avenue. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, it's a delicate balance there if, in fact, that is what is pursued. You know, the Me Too movement, there have been criticism that people are just jumping in on this, that people are just saying, yes, you know, he raped me too. Yes, he sexually harassed me as well. And if that is the case, then there is this argument that can be made that he's the victim. I'm not saying I agree with that argument, but there is that argument that this is all getting out of hand and that you can just say anything, you can accuse someone, and it you know, convicts them in the court of public opinion. Now, Vinu, we di I did hear something that was also interesting from the prosecution. One of the questions they asked the jury was, well, they equated something to a robbery. Well, if somebody is robbed and they put their hands up and they don't fight back, that's still a robbery. Why do you think they asked that question of the jury? I think that's quite a stretch in a, in a, in a, in a rape case. Uh, and I think they're trying to say that if these, these girls, uh, clearly what they're trying to do is say that they didn't scream, they didn't yell, therefore that means that they could still be raped. And that's fine. Understand that that's, a, that's a, an analogy that I think is taking the whole thing a little too far, right? And, and getting back to the strategy, defense strategy, I, I think it would be a terrible mistake if they go try to paint Harvey Weinstein as a victim. I think what they got to say is you don't have to like Harvey Weinstein, but this was business in Hollywood. All these women knew what they were doing, everybody did, and that's what they did. This is not rape. You may not have to like Harvey Weinstein. You may not have to have drinks with him. You may not want to be anywhere near him. But that doesn't mean because these women now regret it years later and they feel guilty about it or they're jumping in on this movement that he committed these rapes. Well, talking about what you also talked about was the settlement. Uh, we had the opportunity to interview several of his accusers, several of Harvey Weinstein's accusers, and they too spoke about the settlement and also some of his Harvey Weinstein's statements that he made to the media. Take a look. The, the thing that also came out this past week or the past week and a half was the idea of the proposed settlement, the $25 million settlement. And that's an individual decision that every uh, alleged victim of Harvey Weinstein is going to have to make to whether or not to opt in or not. Uh, again, the terms of this would be, my understanding is he doesn't pay anything out of pocket. He doesn't have to admit any wrongdoing. And that has nothing to do with the criminal trial. The criminal trial is completely separate. But that settlement that that made such headlines. How do you feel about it? Um, well, again, I think that was uh, the, uh, the media machine um, being played by Harvey Weinstein. I think that it's not a coincidence at all that that settlement made, the, made headlines before the trial. Um, I, uh, I, I find it fascinating that um, that that could be seen as some sort of payback for what has happened. Um, if you look at the cost of what trauma can do, uh, not to mention the cost of being blacklisted by Harvey Weinstein, some of those women's careers were stalled, ruined, um, um, unplugged. They, they have suffered physical costs. Um, several of them have had uh, stress-related illnesses, PTSD, um, if you if you try to if you try to do the math on the true cost of what his behavior has been for the women who have come forward, not to mention for the women who have not yet come forward, um, who we represent, um, I think there's no monetary amount that that you could necessarily put on their trauma and their 
livelihoods. We've heard that there's a proposed settlement of $25 million. He did an interview with the New York Post saying that he's the forgotten man and that uh, he's done so much for women. And as he's saying this, it's approaching his upcoming trial, which we'll get into in a second. But these, these statements, these different things that have happened in the last two weeks, what's your reaction to it all? With what he said about women, I think, like, I'm a forgotten man. I mean, first, I thought it was delusional. And I thought it was a ploy to make him look sort of pathetic and get some attention. In, in any way make us feel sorry for him or people feel sorry for him. But it, it also just can't, when I think of all he did for women, I keep thinking of all he did to women. I mean, he did more, he shattered more people, he broke more people's dreams, he tortured people. He absolutely tortured people. And it seems like there's no, I mean, he did way more of that than he did buoy up women and help different women have careers. And even the ones he helped have careers, he hurt them also at the same time. So um, that's still the picture I see of Harvey. Um, I'm not personally attached to the settlement. Um, so my views are more in general for the public. Um, I just want this to be looked at for what it is. And I, I would... I would prefer it to come out of some kind of funds that affect himself and not the insurance company, of course. I, I just, I want justice. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not happy about that part, but um, you know what, honestly, I'm, I'm happy that we're just talking about this right now. <laughs> okay, and speaking of comments made and talking, asking the million dollar question, Harvey Weinstein, from what I observe, seems to be very involved in his defense. He made comments to the New York Post. This guy has always been in control of his life and his career. Is he going to take the stand and tell his side of the story about what happened with these women? Absolutely not. And he can't take the stand. You know, Vinu agrees with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I agree>. Excellent. <laughs> you know, finally, um, you know, the twenty-five million dollars settlement. That's just one case. There could be other civil cases against him. And what is he going to say on the stand? Oh yes, all of these women wanted to have sex with me. They consented. Okay, great. They consented. But the position that he's in, Weinstein Co. It's his company. That can absolutely be used against him in a civil action for damages. Well, I just will tell you, it would be amazing to watch. Now, unfortunately, it's not televised. And unfortunately, there are no computers uh, with emails. You're not allowed to email. You're not allowed to tweet. There's no cell phones allowed in the courtroom. What you hear is based upon what the reporters are saying, other than sketch artists uh, drawing what happens. Why is that the case? Why do we have this limited amount of media access to the courtroom, Vino? It was all up to Judge Burke. New York State allows courtrooms in the camera. He could have allowed this if he wanted to. He could allow photographers to come in there and take photographs, stills. He didn't want it. I think part of the reason is that Burke is Burke. He's a, he's a showman, as I mentioned. And he's, he's not your typical judge because he's got this larger-than-life personality. And I think a lot of it would come out. And I think that would ultimately affect the trial. And I don't think he wanted that kind of uh, exposure. He's getting enough right now. The, ju the Judge Ito uh, syndrome from <laughs> O.J. Simpson. All right, final thoughts. Terry, uh, what do you make of opening statements coming out? We have about a minute. I think they're important. I think everyone's going to be watching. I think they're going to establish what they hope to show at trial. And they're going to talk about the women coming on the stand and believing these women. Vinu, 20 seconds. I think you just go on as uh, if I'm the defense. I go and you attack these, these women. You, you don't try to paint Harvey Weinstein as a nice guy and just say, look, he's, he is who he is, but he didn't commit any rape. And these people have other reasons for coming forward. I got to say, both of the discussion from both of you this past hour are fantastic about Harvey Weinstein. We hit a lot here, and clearly there's more to talk about. We haven't even seen opening statements yet, but that will happen on January 22nd, which is when I plan to be back in the courtroom. So I want to thank both of my guests for coming on today. I'm going to be signing off, but you're in great hands because Brian Buckmeyer is up next. A lot we're covering here on Long Crime. Stay tuned.